Hello, my name is Dr. Gary Simmons and this is part one in a video series called the Integral Membership System. I talked about the Integral Membership System in the last video series, a new funding model for evolving out of a sense of not enough, where we looked at moving from a tithing-based funding system to an ownership-based funding system. When we look at the Integral Membership System as the primary means to support an ongoing process that allows ownership to be a concept and a value that flourishes as a part of the organizational life and unfoldment of what we are about within our ministry practice. In other words, we're cultivating ownership and our integral membership system or the system by which we bring people into a governance within our organization happens. And so we need to, um, um, we need to embed uh, these new programs that bring forth evolutionary uh, imperatives within our ministry practice if it's going to lead to uh, shifting our church's culture. So as we look at our current system for bringing people into governing membership or voting membership as it's most commonly uh, referred to, um, it's a very simple process. In, in most New Thought churches, it's simply a process of making application and there may be a few requirements to, uh, to attend a few classes. But other than that, there is absolutely no value to becoming a voting member other than uh, the psychological incentive that's associated with it because there's actually nothing that is required. In other words, there are no accountabilities. There are no accountabilities for those who become our voting members. So let that sink in for a moment. And when we understand that uh, our current ministry practice creates a kind of dysfunction associated with how we take in uh, our, our governing and voting members, uh, we need to look at that practice because that's part of what is um, uh, the unintended consequence of, of how we do ministry in this day and age. And so as we look at our current system and as also we compare it to the trends, we will find that there is absolutely more retention when you complexify the process of becoming a governing or voting member. And so when we look at the process of bringing people into greater ownership, absent of there being a system that brings people systematically into deeper levels of engagement, uh, it all happens by accident. So I've already mentioned that the integral membership system is a seamless pathway for moving first-timers into competent leadership. And I'll have more to say about that uh, in, in subsequent videos. In addition, I also um, want to make the point that it is an intentional program that is specifically designed to cultivate the culture of ownership. And so this is something that does not exist in our New Thought movement, an intentional program that moves first-timers into a seamless process of, over time, cultivating their depth of involvement and engagement into our ministry practice. It's also a program that creates more organizational complexity, and now this might be counterintuitive in some respects, but suffice to say that with more organizational complexity, there becomes greater capacity for us to, uh, to establish, for instance, structures of accountability. In other words, what do we count on our governing members or our voting members for? Because we have yet to really be very specific and to be able to say, this is what you say yes to when you want to join or you want to belong or you want to become a voting member. We don't have that uh, so explicit and specific that a person knows exactly what they say yes to and therefore what they are uh, willing to be held accountable to fulfill in their yes. And, and so I'll have a lot more to say about that. Because in the integral membership system, within the context of the mission-centered ministry practice, um, our governing members are held accountable to what they say yes to. And, and you'll see how that works uh, in a little while. But suffice to say that as we look at the system of uh, bringing people into greater ownership, we're also seeing this very system as a means by which we systematically cultivate the emotional and spiritual maturity of those who ultimately will become our partners. So as we look at what is the integral membership system, we're going to look at two phases. And, and uh, the labyrinth as a symbol, the labyrinth walk as a process is a perfect metaphor for what we're describing as the integral membership system. 
So as you consider the labyrinth, the first phase of that journey is the entry into the system itself. And as you think about your own experience of walking the labyrinth, the first phase is your shedding uh, everything that's, that's not you. So that you're in the process of uh, differentiating who you are from who you are not. And, and so the first phase of this process is all about your own personal transformation, your own awakening to that dimension of yourself that's infinite and eternal, that is the, that is the presence of God embodied in, in who you are. And, and so in this journey of, of growing into a greater awareness of one's um, essential nature and worth, um, it's, it, it's independent of having a sense of what the organization is about and up to. And so we differentiate these two phases. The first phase is all about belonging, all about deepening one's uh, spiritual practice and one's connection to the community and one's involvement with uh, the organization and, and with the dynamics of the activities of, of the community. And so as we see this as different than the next phase of membership, which is the return with respect to the labyrinth, where when, when you exit the labyrinth, it's about giving back. It's about now taking this newfound sense of, of who we are and what our purpose is and now offering it as what uh, is our offering to helping to co-create a world that works for everyone. So with these two phases in mind as a developmental way in which we are cultivating um, those who want to journey with us as opposed to just having them tag along and, and partaking with the buffet that we offer. No, we're actually inviting people to become engaged in our system. Our system that moves them systematically first through a transformative experience and then second to a systematic way of, of deepening their capacity to make a difference by as we say in, 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 our, in our purpose statement, transforming lives and inspiring pay people to make a positive difference in their world. So that's the second half. So the first half is transforming lives, experiencing what transformation means in the first phase of our community membership. And the second phase in, in, in the context of governing membership and ownership is all about giving back. It's all about learning uh, what our, is our capacity to do what we can and especially in the context of our new funding model, when we get to that place where we're holding up the mirror and asking people to do what they can in the presence of what is the need of the ministry, we, we want people at a much more mature place within the context of their valuing what is happening and their capacity to partner with us as leaders, as New Thought leaders, to really move our organization into a sustainable ministry practice. So with these two phases, of the integral membership system, um, a belonging phase, which is phase one, and an ownership phase, owner partner phase, which is phase two. We, we want to now look at the distinctiveness between those two phases and also separate those two phases with respect to time. And, and so as we explore the nuances of the integral membership system, we do indeed want to consider it as a journey. And, and journeys aren't, uh, aren't fast tracks. I mean, when did you take a vacation <laughs> when you wanted to go 100 miles an hour through every single activity? No, a journey is something that you can savor and you can uh, pause along the way and you can engage in depth and, um, and have an opportunity to integrate the learnings that, that happen organically in a progression of transforming your own life and deepening in your understanding your capacity to own what is unfolding in your life experience. And so as we begin this journey with people, um, there's also context for how we engage people into the system itself. So I'm going to describe the various aspects of the first phase of the integral membership system that's all, all about deepening one's own personal connection. Remember the two phases of the labyrinth walk. So the first phase of the integral membership system actually uses another system that I haven't described yet, but it is also integral to the process. And that is the welcoming system, the welcoming ministry. And this is one of the takeaways of our pilot program, the Transformation Experience produced a number of guidebooks, which were um, instrumental in being able to uh, document some of the uh, field-tested and field-proven 
uh, modules that we created for the pilot program. And one of these is the welcoming system. And I'll have another whole video series all about the welcoming system and how it is a perfect fit for the ministry, a mission-centric uh, ministry practice. And so the welcoming system is a process, uh, very simply put, that moves very quickly uh, to bring a first-timer into some meaningful engagement, either through involvement in spirit groups or um, moving them into uh, classes and activities or programs that engage them in a more meaningful way. And, and also we're going to describe uh, with respect to what someone says yes to with each of these uh, aspects of membership. So there are three things that we ask those who would be community members, three things that they would say yes to. And we'll also have a conversation as to what governing members say yes to as well. And then in addition to the welcoming system, which brings them into uh, either an engagement of our, our programs, such as spirit groups or some of the activities and um, service opportunities that are available, but ultimately there is um, an orientation, a process by which people are brought into a deeper conversation as to what community membership is all about. And then we have a community member celebration where we bring people up in front of everybody during a Sunday service and welcome them into our spiritual family. And, and so that gives you an overview of the first phase of, of the integral membership system, the community member role. Now, this is not an organizational role, so when we talk about the need to align our bylaws with uh, the systems that are important as we evolve from minister-centric to mission-centric ministry, we'll have to have a different uh, set of bylaws that uh, support a uh, more egalitarian system as opposed to a top-down minister-centric context for our ministry practice. Uh, one one uh, important bylaws change that we'll have to shift in order for the integral membership system to work is our term of membership, our term of voting membership or governing member. And that will be discussed in detail in, in, in a subsequent video. But for now, let us uh, look at um, the phase one, the community member process and the elements that are important to have as a part of our infrastructure as, as we move people into the system itself. And I'll say on the onset that the integral membership system is something that is transitioned into as opposed to something that people wake up and here it is. <laughs> Next Sunday we're going to start it this way. No, it's something that is transitioned into and it only affects those who come into the community. The people who are already present are always grandfathered in. The rule of thumb when it comes to evolving culture is do not displace anybody, in, especially when you're introducing new uh, structures, practices, and systems. Just allow the new structures, practices, and systems to take root and begin to flourish, and what will happen is that which is not serving the greater good of the ministry's evolution will fall away. It'll just, uh, it'll just fall away. That's just the way it works in, in, our, uh, in this uh, evolutionary process, especially in the, in the mission-centric coaching program. Um, the effort is, is to add new things that integrate this new uh, ministry practice as opposed to take away stuff and, and have people deal with the, the upset of shifting sands. Now, while changes do occur, uh, the significant changes that alter the way people are in relationship to one another and to the, um, the old way of being doesn't happen uh, by jerking people into uh, new programs and systems, but it happens as a natural evolution of people growing into a more evolved place. And, and so because I've also mentioned that our effort is transcend but also include, there's always an artifact or remnant of, of the old way that keeps people connected to their traditions and to what's really meaningful as we move towards new innovation and uh, new paradigms and practices for our new mission-centric model of ministry. And so as we look at phase one, I'm going to be talking about the elements of phase one in terms of the integral membership system. So we're looking at the community member role, which I'm describing it as a role, in, uh, because it is a community role, not an organizational role, so there's no need to um, include that necessarily in your bylaws. And I'll say, as I mentioned, I'll say more about what has to change in your bylaws with respect to bringing this new integral system online. 
So the purpose of the um, welcoming uh, system that I'll talk about and we'll have some more videos on is to move first timers very rapidly into a meaningful relationship within the church community. And so the aim is, is that within six weeks, all first timers get engaged in a spirit group. And, and I'll say more about spirit groups, but just suffice to say, spirit groups is a small group ministry program that was developed by uh, Mindy Odlin, who is a licensed Unity teacher, who is founder of Unity FM, who now serves a ministry in, uh, in, in Colorado, as well as uh, uh, directing the spirit group effort. And spirit groups is a very powerful way to expedite um, a mission-centric ministry evolution. In other words, it's a way of, of uh, moving that forward because spirit groups drives organizational development. And once again, I'll have a lot more to say about that and it's integral to the mission-centric ministry coaching program. But um, suffice to say that that spirit groups is going to, is going to be a platform or an embedded partner within the, uh, the mission-centric ministry practice because it, it, is, it is a venue that enables us to do many, many things. Uh, including leadership development. So, so what if a new person, when they're uh, arriving within the ministry, uh, and and they are interested in be participating in whatever membership system or process that's available, what if everything that is important to their unfolding in the context of what qualifies them for deeper and more integral roles within the church that typically is reserved for voting members or those of of, of, uh, that have tenure or time in, in our church uh, system. Um, it, it, it's important for us to be able to see how, how the spirit group process is able to help accommodate so many aspects of what is important to evolving into mission-centric ministry. So, so for instance, um, as opposed to having all kinds of programs and activities, what if spirit groups can become a, a one-place uh, stop where people can fulfill certain qualifications as they journey towards the governing member role. So for instance, um, when in our system, in, in the community member process, they're asked to say yes to three things. The first thing they say yes to is deepening their spiritual practice. And then we invite them to do that through spirit groups because spirit groups is one of the most profound, transformative uh, venues that, that we can possibly imagine for ourselves. I mean, think about Sunday service. It's not possible to have people necessarily, universally, to have a depth of transformation just by hearing our Sunday talk. It's, so, it's mostly a kind of uh, lifting people into a healthier place and, as they get ready for their busy week. But spirit groups, small group ministries, is where people actually engage in the deeper experience of our transformative principles. And, and it becomes the context for them actually engaging in their own personal transformation. And, and, and so we're going to invite people uh, to work the, through our system in the most expeditious and most profound and transformative way possible. And so spirit groups becomes a way in which we can not only engage new people, uh, but we can also deal with the depth of transformation that is important to us in the context of fulfilling our purpose. And it's also a way in which they can fulfill the second thing that they say yes to, and that's participate in some form of meaningful service within our community or beyond. And so spirit groups, the unique thing about spirit groups is, is that there is an aspect of the group, small group ministry process that is all about service within the church, within uh, the church ministry and within its stakeholders. So service and transformation happen through spirit groups. The two uh, primary things that people say yes to in the first phase of community membership, deepening in their spiritual practice and some form of meaningful service can all be fulfilled through spirit groups. And so rather than having a menu of things, programs and activities that they have to participate in, why not just give folks an engaging opportunity, an invitation to engage the most transformative thing that you have to offer? And that is small group ministry. 
In addition to that, of course, they're invited to engage in the Q process, but that's a qualification for our governing member role, and I'll say more about that later. So as we look at uh, what they say yes to in the context of the community member role, saying yes to deepening their spiritual practice and some form of meaningful involvement, either through spirit groups or through other areas of service, we have a program of, of sacred service and spiritual gifts and, and really getting them connected to their purpose and passion and then aligning their purpose and passion with opportunities within the ministry. And so, so we have a sacred, uh, sacred service and spiritual gifts component to our um, community member orientation and what they say yes to, as well as the spirit groups component, which is um, very easy for people to engage and accommodate very quickly early on. And then in the course of, of, of their engaging in our process, it's very simple. They just attend an orientation meeting and then they uh, uh, fill out an application where they say yes to deepening their spiritual practice. And finally, the third thing that they say yes to is fulfilling a minimum member contribution. In order for us to be able to have a conversation about a minimum member contribution, the real problem or the real resistance to that conversation is, is, is the leaders, <laughs> us. We have the difficult conversation because I'm going to share our experience of, of how this has worked at, at Union Spiritual Center here in Spokane. And isn't that our greatest fear that in our conversations about money, people are going to get triggered and then leave? And that is indeed a reality that we have to, uh, have to address. We have to be skillful in our conversations especially when it comes to uh, issues of money and especially when we're coming from our own sense of not enough. But, but when we're looking at um, asking our community members to begin their relationship to the ministry in the context of uh, what would be their integrity to be in uh, doing their fair share with respect to valuing what the ministry represents to them where they are at in their early relationship to the church. So it's, it's not about asking them to go all in on, on just owning the organization. It's asking them to look at the principle of what does it mean to be in integrity with respect to uh, what it takes to make this organization work in the context of one's valuing what that deeper relationship is really all about. And so the skill in these conversations is the make or break point. And, and that's why it's important to be coached to this and not try to have to figure it all out yourself because uh, my experience is, is that when that occurs uh, and there's the slightest bit of ambiguity or unclarity or um, a sense that you're just trying to uh, make this stuff up as you go, uh, it's not going to work. So in part two of this video series, I'll be talking more specifically about the minimum member contribution and how that contributes uh, systematically to the increase of our uh, capacity to uh, meet our expenses. So looking at the integral membership system as an overarching uh, methodology for facilitating the cultivation of ownership, it in and of itself is an aspect of the new funding model. So this is an important uh, component to see that the community member and the governing member uh, phase of the integral membership system each contributes in its own way to increasing the amount of funds that are available to meet the expenses of the ministry.